after Bishop. How many enjoyed Bishop Dominic Alote? Wow, what, what a, how many know he laid a lot of stuff on us? How many would say it, it was, he laid a lot of stuff on us? A whole lot. So we want to, we want to hit on it a little bit and talk to you about it. Uh, I really believe we're in a paramount a, a change. I was driving to church today, and uh, before I go any further, let me welcome all those watching by way of the internet that is coming on now live on Facebook, on Periscope, Roku, and everywhere, and maybe watching replay. I just want to encourage you to know that whenever you're watching, whatever time of day you're watching this, the anointing is still the same anointing no matter what time of day you're watching it. The same God. He doesn't change because of time and, and time zones. He's outside of time coming in right on time on your behalf. So you believe these things and reach for these things. But I was driving to church today, started listening. I, I have my grandbabies riding with me, and I started listening to Holy Ground. And, uh, the, you know, the, we are standing on Holy Ground. How many know that song? You know, we are standing. I won't sing it because I went to, I can't sing university. And <laughs> got a doctorate in it. And, uh, so, uh, but, but I, I was feeling the presence of God, and immediately the voice of God said to me uh, that you're about to see my hand move mightily on the earth. How many want to see a mighty hand of God move on the earth? He said, you're about to experience a mighty hand of God. The Holy Spirit speaking to me. And I was starting to get downloaded, but JoJo wanted me to move to another song, and I went from that to Moana, lost it all in Moana. <laughs> so... I'll get back on the way home, maybe listen to it. So, um, but I believe that Dominic Alote, we, all our speakers this year, and that's that he was our last speaker, and we purposely wanted him last, uh, unless God sent somebody unexpectedly. Uh, but Mike Brown came and really laid out some things on promise and on honor, and then uh, unexpected guest that God sent here was Dr. James Payne, and I, I love Dr. James Payne. I put him on next year. How many like Dr. James Payne? He has texted me. He's called me. He has emailed me. He's done everything to tell me he's part of the favor. He's trying to get us to move our church to Nashville. How many want to move to Nashville? He's trying us to move to Nashville. Only a few of you. I guess we ain't moving then. I can't get a majority. Who's tired of Hickory wants to go to Nashville? <laughs> you know, Forget Nashville. Who wants to start a church in Miami, Florida, or... Uh, <laughs> On the beach, well, I'll be on the beach with, with, our, with no shoes on having church. Praise on the beach, church. That's what we're going to call it. Who's going? Is the band going with us? You going? Na Nashville, Nashville, Nashville. Lewis, you can't go to Nashville. You're Latino. You got to go to Miami with us. Nate. You go to Nashville. <laughs> there you go. Ah, glory to God. He doesn't hit. I'll go where you are. Hey, did y'all win yesterday? You did? I pray for you. Not really. But <laughs> I didn't want to be a liar, man. <laughs> it wasn't for Daryl posting on Facebook. I wouldn't know y'all won. <laughs> but then we had James Payne who really, I, I'm telling you, has mastered the real meaning of the seed and how to get in a future with your seed today. And then Dominic Alote Whew. told me before he left, he said, your church is right slap in the middle of demonic warfare. He said, your city, this is what he said, listen to this, the city has stronger demons than New York in religious control. Let me tell you that again. This city has more religious demonic control than New York. Let me say that again. Maybe you ain't hearing me. This city we live in looks small. Looks like it's not much, but supernaturally, for some reason, it's a connector of what God's going to do in the South. It's going to be the tavern. Hickory means tavern. 
Hickory was a watering hole. Every culture stopped in this area right here to fill up to go on down south. This a watering hole for renewal, recovery, and refreshment. Oh, y'all ain't see nobody listening to me. Ain't nobody listening to me. You didn't just tell you why the devil's fighting this city. Because when God moves out of this out of this area, it's for recovery, refreshing spirits. It's gonna be a watering hole of the supernatural. Hallelujah. How many would how many are tired of struggling and fighting things and would like some refreshing renewal rain of heaven to just fall on your family, on your home, on your mind? How many want this the addictions to get up out your house? You know, a lot of, when I say addiction, that gluttony demon, it's deeper than drugs. Uh, you're addicted to feelings. You're addicted to fear. You could be addicted. I mean, my God, I feel a, a breaking even now. The hand of the Lord moved mightily. Somebody watching, God's going to heal your body right now. God's going to heal your body right now. I'm going to say it one more time. God's going to heal your body. Right now. Whoo, glory to God. Some of you, just so I'll talk to my director for a moment, when I'm talking to the media, come to this middle camera right here. It's a better shot for Facebook. So now what I was saying was, some of you, if you could get a certificate, listen to me now. Some of you, if the enemy was passing out degrees for doing wrong things, you'd have your doctorate already. Let, let, me, let me talk to the online people for a moment. This camera right here, director, that camera right there. Some of you, if the enemy was giving certificates for wrong decisions, you'd have a doctorate right now, a Ph.D. in wrong. Why am I telling you that? Because God said he's going to use it as a doctorate for your future. Oh, hallelujah. He's going to make you a better future over all the mistakes you made. He's going to break every curse, every chain. Oh, hallelujah. How many got some curses you want broken up over your past right now? He's going to show his hand mightily. Talk to you a little bit. Let's, let's highlight what we learned for a little bit. One of the things Dominic said, and I want you to write down. I want you to go to 2 Kings chapter 13. 2 Kings chapter 13. I want you to get out of being religious. I want you to get out of being a churchy. I want you to, I want you to move away from uh, denominational doctrines and come over into the kingdom's doctrine. So whether you're uh, Pentecostal holiness, whether you're Church of God in Christ, whether you're uh, Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, Catholic, whatever, whatever you were raised in culturally, you got a singularity of your teaching. You got what they want you to know, only what they want you to know, and then some of you've crossed, you've crossed pollinated out of nominal churches over into Pentecostal churches, and you got, some, and you went from a singularity to a, a binary kind of learning. Uh, but in the kingdom of God, it is so diverse into more than just a couple of things. There's so many doors to to more, and to change and to power. And if I could get it, if I could get it into the young people to learn the kingdom now. By the time they're my age, they'll rule everything they have. They won't just be professors and doctors and lawyers. They'll also be financially free. Amen? So, verse 15, 2 Kings 13, verse 15. I'm just going to show you everything about God's strategic. Uh, for 2 Kings 13. When you went to, when you were reading in Genesis 12, stay, at the, stay where you are. I just, just want to let you know. God gives him seven promises. He says, if you'll leave your home, you leave your family, you uh, leave your culture, you leave your ra what you've learned, and you come out here and learn me. That's what he said when he said, follow me. He said, stop what you learned there. Now come out here and learn who I am. Come out here. 
he said, I'll give you these seven blessings. So we know that God is a God of sequence, and, and he's a God. And, and I want to show you all through the Bible his mysteries. Now, Elisha, verse, uh, we'll start in verse 15, because Elisha is sick, and the, and the Bible said this was sick unto death. He's sick, and this is, this is the sickness that's taking his life, verse 15. And Elisha said to him, uh, to jo, uh, Josiah, Josiah is crying over him because the Syrians are coming after him. So Elisha said to him, take a bow and some arrows. And so he took himself a bow and some arrows. And then he said to the king of Israel, put your hand on the bow. And so he put his hand on it. Then Elisha put his hand on the king's hands. You underline that. So he gave him instruction, get a bow, get some arrows. He said, bring it here. He said, put your hand on the bow. But then what did Elisha do? Elisha put his hand on his hand. This anointing that's in Elisha is now going to be, is being departed or imparted into jo, Josiah, the king, or Joash, the king. And he said, open the east window, and he opened it, and then Elisha said, shoot, and he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of the deliverance from Syria. For you must strike the Syrian at Epic till you have destroyed them. I want you to underline this, till you have destroyed them. Okay? Now he tells them, shoot the arrow. And he said, the arrow that you shoot out the window is the arrow of deliverance. Now, I want to stop here and make a prophetic word. I prophesy right now that God is opening the east windows of your house, uh, and he's about to have you shoot the arrow of deliverance uh, out into your future, and things that you thought could not be delivered shall be delivered back into your hand in Jesus' name. What I want to know, who, buy, who connects to that right now? Who connects to that in the kingdom? That God's about to shoot an arrow of deliverance in areas uh, in your future, okay, into the kingdom of God and reclaim what you thought could never claim, be claimed back. Oh, hallelujah. Lost money, lost lands, lost heritages. God's about to take back lost cultures. If you're of the uh, a black race right now and your ancestors were in slavery in this state, that arrow's going to reclaim things that were stolen from your genealogy through injustice. Oh, hallelujah. If you're of the Jewish culture and your family was in the Holocaust, there are things laid buried in the ground of Germany that God's about to bring back into your culture, diamonds and gold and wealth. Why? Because the end time church is about to be inundated with the blessing of deliverance. I dare somebody to shout deliverance right now. And if I didn't hit your culture, if I didn't hit your genealogy, you go ahead and hit it right now and claim it. Because something in your bloodline is more than just been cursed. If hell was attacking you, this is what God said to me when Dominic and I were talking. If hell was attacking your past to try to lay a curse on your bloodline, it's because he saw what your bloodline would be in his future and how detrimental you would be if that curse wasn't laid in your past. But the blood of Jesus Christ shall redeem me from all the curse of the past. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. I made some declarations when he was here. But God said, but remember, when you shut these doors, I will never open them again and nor shall hell. Hallelujah. So he said, shoot this arrow. And so the first phase of understanding kingdom is I've got to know there's a deliverer in the house. And I've got to get involved with this deliverer. And I need the hand of a man of God to get in agreement to my, my, fo my focus, my future, where, where we're going. Stretch your hand like this to me. I put my hand on your hand right now. May the anointing, may the anointing, may the anointing on my life now be anointed in your life. That whatever God has called you to do, it shall now increase and shall be delivering you into your future. How many receive that? Give God praise. I pause there for a moment 
to give you a little prophetic because me and Bishop was talking, and he said, when you feel the anointing, you need to stop your preaching for a moment, and you need to prophesy to the ears of your people. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to show you that in a minute. And so he said, open the window and shoot the arrow, verse 18. And then he said, take the arrows, so he took them, and he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground, and so he struck the ground three times. Then a lot, listen, he struck the ground three times. Verse 19, he stopped. And the man of God was what? He was angry. He was angry with him and said, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck Syria till you had destroyed it. But now you will strike Syria only three times. Now the reason the man of God was angry was because he's going to die right after this prophecy. And he's trying to let him know. And when I read this, the Holy Spirit said, the problem with people is you, you quit too soon. You stop too soon just as you start to get ahead, you don't drive through and cut off the head of what's kept you in bondage. And because you've not learned how to keep pushing even when prosperity shows up. As soon as you get through something, you don't realize that there's another enemy waiting on you and you and the easiest thing is that we become lazy just when we get enough breakthrough that we don't feel the pressure no more, but we don't stay in the posture until we've utterly destroyed it where it can never rear its ugly head again. And we got so many people that come to the altars and they get right with God, but they don't cut off the head of the serpent in their house. This is what we're talking about when we talk about spiritual warfare. We get a good feeling of God and praise, but still the serpent of fear gets a hold of us. We get a good place in our seed, and then fear comes over when God starts to stretch us. We have to become a people that push through. Tell four or five people, say, you got to push further. you got to pray longer. You're going to give harder. Don't give up. And don't let up. People that give up stop before they feel any victory. But there's a people on the earth that when they start feeling the victory, the most dangerous thing they do is they let up and let the enemy gain ground back. So now we know... This has got a sequence, and I've been trying to teach you, and I set you up for Dominic for the last three services. I've been telling you about seven demons and seven archangels and, and, and the seven spirits of hell, that the doors of hell that come against you. And just so you're, maybe you're a guest and you didn't hear it, that the seven demons of uh, Lucifer, Mammon, uh, uh, Asmodeus, Satan, uh, Beelzebub, Leviathan, uh, Belphab- Belphagar, pride, greed, lust, wrath, gluttony, envy, sloth, or slothfulness, laziness. And then there's seven archangels and seven churches in Revelation and seven spirits of God and there's seven days in a week and seven seals and seven bowls and seven trumpets and seven vials. There's seven doors of revenue. Seven doors that God wants to put blessing, not just money, but blessing in your house. Wisdom, knowledge, Information, relationships, property, real estate, product, money. So now we know he's got a 777. Then we have to understand then that even when they were taking the land in Deuteronomy, he said, when you go into this battle, when you go into this promised land, before you get the blessing, you got to fight seven nations. Did he not say that? 
He said you're going to fight seven nations. You would find that in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 1 and 2. As a matter of fact, I read it. He said, when the Lord your God brings you into the land which you, which you uh, go to possess, he has cast out many nations before you. He's cast these nations out. The Hittites, the Gershites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. Seven nations. What are they? Seven nations greater. Seven nations stronger. Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 2, 1 and 2. They are mightier. They are stronger. It says God's delivered them over to you. So, so now we, we have to see God's battle plan. We have to see his strategy. We have to understand how he works. Listen to how God talks. Because you're going to see the, there's four things that the enemy, stay right here for a moment. There's four things that the enemy is going to try to destroy and control. The enemy's got to control four areas of your life. These four areas is where the curses are trying to control you. It's where uh, it's why you're not getting breakthroughs. That's why you you pray. But the, the uh, something Dominic said, two things Dominic said that I really liked in the uh, Saturday. Uh, There's a bunch of things, but two things that I want to deal with today. Number one that he said that I, I really uh, gravitated to was uh, that the enemy wants you to, f- the devil wants you to start fighting the wrong enemy. And this really got to me. So your warfare is useless. And I didn't understand that until I started looking at it. And it says it's not that your warfare is meaningless. It means you whooping an enemy. But the problem was it wasn't the enemy you needed to whoop for yourself. And here's what I've kind of come to find out. A lot of times uh, I'm fighting an enemy, and the enemy that I'm fighting uh, is, is not meaningless, so I whooped an enemy that helped Carlos, or I whooped an enemy that might help Marianne. The problem is it's the enemy that's trying to destroy me that I haven't fought yet. And then I remember uh, uh, reading some of my military books, uh, and I remember something that I, I hadn't thought about till Dominic said that, uh, because something that's, that's very powerful is that the, the general said, the enemy is not going to destroy you, listen, where, where you're weakest. The enemy is going to destroy you where you have strength. Now, that doesn't make no sense, does it? Why would the enemy attack where my strength is? Why would the enemy come after where my strengths are? Why is it something about my strength he's going to exploit and use it against me? Because he knows you know your weaknesses. And he knows because you know your weaknesses, you have decided to guard them. But what you left unguarded is your strengths. And so... He knows your weaknesses, and you know your weaknesses, and you know you're trying to get overcome your weaknesses. So all your prayers are about your weaknesses. All your studies are about your battles and your failures, right? But the area which is strong in you, you left unguarded. So what he does is he doesn't come to defeat your strengths, but he comes to exploit them in your feelings. Are you with me? And so we have to understand there's four areas Satan wants to control. He controls these four areas. You're done. Number one, and it's going to sound redundant, but it's the truth, your mind. My greatest battlefield is my mind. My mind is the deciding factory to everything I feel. Now, you can't cheapen these feelings because feelings are real. Feelings are feelings will destroy you. So my mind. So you got to get your mind right. Why? When, 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 why was the prophet mad? Because the mentality of Joash was three. And he said, man, if you were being the man, you should have been the king. You should have kept hitting the ground until I told you to stop. You should have kept, I didn't tell you to hit it three times. I said, take the arrow and strike the ground. You decided when to stop. Now, many of us try to live our lives the same way. We don't want to let a mentor keep taking us further than we feel like going. But the real victory 
is when you get past your feeling mind and get into your prophetic mind. Oh my God, I'm trying to help somebody. Look at somebody and say, get over your feelings. Tell four or five people, say, get over how you feel. Now, my wife's got to constantly try to line me up because I am an over-feeling person. I feel, and feelings are real. And I have had to learn how to praise God in spite of how I feel. I had to learn how to give in spite of how I feel. Uh, I, I, I'll tell you, I had to learn how to talk to uh, people that have done things to my family in spite of what I'm feeling. I've learned how to get a hold of a ministry mind uh, in a miserable mood. Now, it used to take me months to get over the feeling. Then. Then it now it takes me uh, less than months, sometimes a day, maybe a week, but I don't go months no more. Only because I've learned that your mind is a muscle. I've learned that your mind is a muscle. I've learned that your mind has to be controlled. I've learned that you have to change its focus or it won't change it for you. I had to learn that there's certain things that I can't keep looking at if I don't want to keep feeling the way I feel. I had to learn to quit listening to certain sounds and certain things because it, I know that it drives my feelings. Now, I like this because Dominic referenced it when he said these, uh, the uh, uh, Canaanites family, Cain's bloodline, would not activate the curse because uh, they knew there were certain things they did. If they did them, the curse would, would involve itself. So they didn't drink drink. They didn't buy houses. They, didn't, uh, uh, they, they, they lived in tents. They wouldn't sow seed. They lived off of people. And then they knew to attach themselves uh, to God's anointed. They uh, knew that if they could get up under the right anointing, uh, that whatever was trying to kill them couldn't get to them because they had a covering. And I've learned this because I, I, and I, I can't just watch the news. I can't just watch it. I can't watch the news. I can't watch it. I can't. I can't. I'm sorry. I can't. I can't get in your car. I got in the car when I was out of town preaching, and the guy had, a, what's some NPR like you like? Is that what it's called? Did I say it right? What is it, what it called? NPR? Is that what it's What does N stand for? National. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. I, I make a stand for no public radio. <laughs> I can't listen to it. I got in the car. The guys listened to it. I said, can you turn that off, please? He said, oh, you don't, you know, uh, it's, uh, I like this station. I said, I, I know you do, but I got to go preach here, and you're my driver. Turn it off. Why? Because by the time I get to the pulpit, I'm going to be so mad and cussing mad, I won't be able to preach. <laughs> oh, let me turn that off, Bishop. I said, thank you very much. I walk in the room. What do I do when you have it on? Thank you very much. There you go. That's my house. Turn that off. She's like, and you know what? She said, oh, my God, grow up. I said, turn it off. I can't grow up. You got to know where you are, and that I ain't grown up yet. It affects my thinking. I am so passionate about my thinking, it affects my thinking. My thinking affects my mood. My mood affects my feelings. My feelings affect my faith. I have to overcome my feelings, and I have to learn that my mind is Satan's place where he wants to rule. Here's the thing about the mind. He doesn't know if he's in your mind. He doesn't know if what he's sending toward your mind is found seed in your mind. He doesn't know if, if, if the, the incident or the environment or the problem or the uh, no, noise or the news or what you're looking at. He doesn't know if it's getting in your mind until... He hears it out of your mouth. He's waiting for you to inform him if what he's doing is working in you. Am I helping anybody, Joe? Is this helping anybody? 
I know it ain't helping half of you because all half of you is religious and you're Jesus Jr. And you've arrived and you're just waiting for your body to be glorified. But the rest of us sinners... He doesn't know. He doesn't know. He doesn't know. He cannot read my mind. God can read my mind. God knows what I'm thinking. He says, I know your thoughts, every thought. I said, oh, don't get up in that thing. I got doors. I said, you don't see my signs? You better, you better honor my privacy. Leave that door alone, private. That's not God. Not God's room, not God's room, not God's room, not God's room, God's room, God's room. That's what I told God. I said, I got some. Do not trespass signs on some of them doors. And he looked at me and said, you can't trespass what you own. Uh, I am your creator. And I said, oh, Lord, I better repent for them doors. And one of the scriptures that feared me as a teenager it was, was said that God will shout your utter thoughts from a rooftop in the end. I thought, oh, keep my mind clean, keep my mind clean, keep my mind clean. The last thing I want God do is shout my thoughts. Oh, I know you're not worried about that, Carlos, are you? you know, oh, you are, okay. <laughs> you give me that look. I mean, how many right now would want God to shout your utter thoughts right now? Oh, not one. Let's bow our heads right now. Oh, Jesus. God, we pray for all the pygmies that are dying, and we pray for all the missionaries. <laughs> Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. My mind has sinned. Aren't you glad he ain't going to judge you for your mind? I told the Lord the cross wouldn't be enough for my mind. The thing about my mind is I have to understand something, that Satan is, 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 Satan is notorious at flooding the atmosphere with stimuli for thinking. And, and because we're, we, we, let, 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 let me say this about uh, America. America is a great country, and I wouldn't want to be in any other nation, but America is a dangerous place in this area because freedom is a dangerous thing if it doesn't have God's perimeters and boundaries on it. So what I'm saying is, is that if you go back and look in the 20s and what they called pornography is nothing what you would call pornography. What we call nothing is pornography in the 20s. So there was a group of people that had a moral conscience is what I'm saying. And they tried to, as much as they could, build boundaries so that generations, the youth, would not be polluted until they could handle the pollution. But we have... 10 and 12 and 9 year olds being flooded information that their mind cannot process in maturity because we were we, we started hitting this word called censorship somebody had to come up started crying censorship that that's censorship that's that that's wrong to to put on a CD, don't, don't have this words. It's wrong. Now, it, now I was reading the laws coming down through Canada. They're voting on it right now. You need to pray. They're voting on right now that parents cannot call their children boy or girl. It would be against the law to identify their gender until they decide. And, and, and I was reading, a, a, and it's a true story, where a young, a, a young girl came home, and she was only like seven, and she came home and at the dinner table told her mom and daddy, uh, I, I, I'm not a girl. And he says, no, baby, you're, you're a girl. She said, no, my teacher today at school told us that we don't know yet. And he said, no, baby, your teacher's wrong. And they said, no, Daddy, we had a whole class on that we're not mature enough to decide what we are yet. Canada, this is not America, this is Canada. It's, come, it's trying to come here. And the Daddy was infuriated. 
and he went to school and he pitched a fit. Went in the principal's office, him and the mom, and he said, what are you telling my kid? He said, she's not a girl. And, and they're saying, well, we just think it's, it's healthy it's for their psyche to develop. To, uh, what are you talking about? God made you a girl or God made you a boy, and that's it. Now, I don't care if you stand like this. You're still a boy. You hear me, Randy? You can stand like this. You're still a man. You just like different colors, then, but it's okay. If Satan can pollute the mind, he's eventually going to pollute the mouth. Your mouth reveals your persuasions. Your mouth. Your mouth it unlocks the promise or the plague of your life. See, your mind is thinking on things. But until it comes out of your mouth, it's not a seed. It's a thought. But words are so powerful that once they come out, they're looking for soil for your future. And many people watching right now are living a present life because of what they kept talking about in their past life. Job made this comment. This is what Job said when all the curses started coming on him and all the plagues. Job said this out of his own mouth. The things I fear the most have come on me. Now think about this. That word feared in the Hebrew was the things I focused on the most have showed up. I don't care if you get any further than these two points. I'm going to give you the others, but listen to me. This is what Job said. The things that I thought about that put fear in me have arrived. Now how did Satan know that was the things he needed to attack Job with. Why was he confident to make a bet with God over Job? And how did he know what to, what to attack Job with? There were many things he could have attacked Job with, but how did he know that these certain few things would be the ones that get him the quickest? Because Job told us why. The things I feared the most, you know he had conversations about it with others. Your greatest liability is your mouth. Your mouth, you would be better off to lose your tongue Why? Because the smallest little thing on your body is the most dangerous muscle of all. It don't have to lift weights, and it don't have to exercise. But if it ever says sound, sound is eternal. God put the eternal power of your life in your mouth. And the door to your mouth is your mind. So he's going to pour on in your natural world everything that stimulates the mind. If you've got a, a sexual, immoral mind, you need to turn off TV for a while and don't, and don't look at any billboards or watch any commercials because everything driving society right now is sexual feelings, sexual promiscuity, the gluttony, of breaking covenant before marriage, soul tying with other bloodlines. There are people that had sex with so many other partners, they've got 30 generational curses stuck up in their soul ties.
Bishop said, you, you, my daughter, my daughter. He said, oh, my God, my daughter, my daughter. He said, I was, he said, can you believe this? Can you believe this? I said, what? He said, She's living with, she was living with a man who stole my identity and got credit cards and charged him in my name, and she's living with the guy. And I told her, but she wouldn't leave him. And he said, I was pacing the floors 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m., no sleep, traveling, couldn't sleep on plane. He said, I was tormented. How could my bloodline stay in the house with a man who stole her daddy's identity and tried to ruin his credit? Stupid, stupid, stupid. He said, but I begin to pray and I begin to talk to the Holy Spirit. And then he said, that ain't the problem. I can give you your identity back. He said, the problem is, is that she done soul tied with that generation. And he said, you praying the wrong prayer. He said, what you need to be praying is breaking them soul ties uh, because that demon's trying to get up into a certain side of her bloodline in her soul. And your soul becomes your psyche. Your psyche becomes your thinking. If you got a wrong thinking psyche uh, you, and then you've been a promiscuous person, you ought to take about one second right now and say, God, I'll break every soul tie according to the blood of Jesus. Matter of fact, we ought to do that right now, those that are watching. Somebody has had multiple partners uh, that you didn't realize that you done picked up their bloodline and their family and their family's generational curse up in your mind but I bind it in the name of Jesus who am I talking to you ought to lay hand on your head as I break every soul tie break it Maybe you're a man sitting there say, well, you know, it works with women lines too. It's a demonic spirit. Why is that, Bishop? Because you couldn't control your mind. You couldn't control your mouth. And you gave Satan a list of weapons to defeat you. But the Bible said old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. You know what that means? The Bible says you can renew your mind. Now listen to this strategic plan for you. I don't care what you've been thinking. I don't care what you've been saying. I don't care what you've done, what you've been doing. Listen to me. In the blood of Jesus Christ, he said, I'll give you a new mind, a renewed mind. And he says, what I'll do is I'll put a new thought in you, and I'll put godly thoughts back in you, and I will wash away what you was thinking what you were saying and old things will pass away and I'll wipe the slate clean and I'll put Satan right there at a clean slate and say now figure them out I done cleaned out all the ammunition you had and if they walk right so the Bible says I put power if death and life it's in your mouth so with one prayer you can wipe the slate clean and if you rethink and retalk you done outsmarted what he thought he had on you yesterday. How many would like to how many would like to make the devil nervous today and forget and not have any weapons today of yesterday's ammunition? Woo! -hoo -hoo -hoo. How many would like to do that right now? Your mouth. Your mind. Let me give you the other three. Your movement. Don't think that God doesn't see where you are. It's not just what you say, it's where you show up. If you're comfortable in wrong places, it's because you got a wrong mouth with a wrong mind. It's good, isn't it? What, what you're comfortable around is the proof of what you think you is where you belong. Your movement reveals your opinion of you. How you move, your posture. Some of you can't win not because you're not a winner, but because when you wake up, you put on the posture of a loser. You put on the conversation of a defeatist because your mind woke up defeated because it went to bed defeated. Some of you had overcome yesterday but decided to relive it today because you wouldn't let it die in your sleep. Oh, hallelujah. Some of you were healed in the night. The only reason why you're still sick is you woke up and confessed it.
One of you win, was winning the lottery last night, but you said something negative. It don't act like you didn't buy a ticket. And it's what, one point something billion? You know why it's one point something billion? Because everybody's playing it. You know why the, tie, the church is broke? Can't ain't nobody playing it. <laughs> Because because you don't believe in the in the return of God, but you do believe in the return of North Carolina's lottery. Yet you ain't won it yet, but you keep tithing to it. But when you woke up, God was still working on your behalf, even though you ain't tithe. Ah, glory to God! I felt like I felt like Shambot right there. Ah, glory to God! What the devil fears is not your salvation. The devil fears your information. Because the more you know him, the more you start acting like him. Your kingdom. Everywhere you go. And here's what God told Abram. He said, it's not enough to have a good mind. He said, listen to me. i got to tell you about this. He said, it's not enough to have a good mind. He said, I know it's not enough just to have a good mouth. He said, let me tell you something. Wherever I see your feet. He says, so you better monitor your movement. You can turn, bump the air up if you're a little cold. Somebody just said, thank you. Was that a black woman? Thank you. <laughs> Mimi, you black? Mimi done turned black over there. Don't let that white, you know what I was going to say, don't let that white Alabama cracker fool you. There's some black up in there. Thank you. <laughs> Hallelujah, thank you, Lord. <laughs> Lay hands on a Christmas. He needs them, gee, hallelujah. Yeah. Don't you tell me stop. Don't you tell me stop. Aaron, get over and handle my light stuff. <laughs> Aaron's like, <laughs> Aaron looked at me and went, H, no. <laughs> you didn't say nothing? See, see, that's that falsely accused spirit came on me. <laughs> False accusation. I'm sorry, Joseph. <laughs> no, her name's not Joseph. You should have read your Bible. <laughs> Number four. We're going to come back on this. You know I don't just preach one thing. You don't want to hear it? Don't come back. I'll talk to the bench. Number four. Money. Satan needs to control these four things to, to bankrupt you. He needs to control your mind and defeat it. He needs to control your mouth, and you need to speak what he's saying, not what God says. You, 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 you got to be very careful because everything around you is telling you to say opposite of what God said. The doctors, you got cancer and you go to the doctor, they tell you everything opposite of what your faith is believing. And you have to be very careful because your mind, and when they start giving you information, you've got to line it up with God's information. Okay? Because the world is talking to you in every minute and every moment and every place. You're picking up conversations you're not even listening to. Okay? Then he needs to control how you move, where you move. Movement, movement reveals your, your opinion of you. Movement reveals where you think you belong. Mo movement, what do you buy? What do you move? What do you, you know? Movement is very important. Where you are is just as, as powerful as what you are and who you are. Matter of fact, you can have the anointing and be the right man. You can be the right woman. You can be the right person with the right anointing, with the, with the power of God, and be in the wrong place. And the anointing can't do anything because places matter to God. God made places before he made people. God didn't make man and then make land. He made land and then he made man. So God made places before he made people. And then he made certain people to be put in certain places. 
and the blessing is not in the promise, your motivation was in the promise, the blessing was in a place. I give you the promise in captivity, but the blessing was in a place where seven enemies were waiting on you. And then he says, this is how God talks. I've given you seven nations. I've already whooped them for you. Okay? Now go over there and fight them. <laughs> I thought you whooped them for me. Well, what I did, you got to get involved with. You got to believe, though they're stronger than you and greater than you, that what I said over here has already happened. You just got to get involved in it. Because the blessing is in the involvement of the place. Some of you are anointed and saved by God, but God can't get you to get activated in the right place. Because you're still attracted to the wrong places. Is this good or what? And some of you could get faith in the right place, church, but when you get home, something goes on in your house that robs you of what you got in the place of God. You need to go home and take back that place. And if you can't get peace in that place, it's time to move out of that place. That's a word. That's a word. That's a word. That's a word. Restlessness should not live in the right place. Some of you have been in the wrong relationship so long you tried to adapt to it. But God knew if you stayed in that place, you would never be what he called you to be. Relationships are always in that place. I, I, if I'm walking some, if I'm in a journey and I'm walking with someone, I need to start evaluating the person I'm connecting to. Why? Because they may be taking me to the wrong place. Don't be unequally yoked. The Bible says two of you can't walk unless you're in a, you're not hearing me. Two of you can't walk together unless you're in what? Okay, so if I'm walking with the wrong person and I'm serving God, and we're still together, one of us are in the wrong agreement. Which one of us is it? And if I'm hanging with the wrong, dating the wrong guy or dating the wrong girl, see, if you're still dating, you're in a good place. You might be with a bad person, but if you're still dating, you're in a good place. You ought to start asking questions. If you're dating a man who can't talk about the future, and when he talks about the future, he don't talk about God in the present, you are dating the wrong guy, and he's going to take you to the wrong place. If you're dating a girl, And she ain't talking about the right things. And she ain't doing, and you got to work at staying in the relationship. She's taking you to the wrong place. Better to be single in the right place. Better to be alone by yourself in the right place with God than to be married or with others in the wrong place away from God. Oh, hallelujah. And if you're walking with the wrong person and they've taken you already to the wrong place, the only way out is to change directions. There is no other way. Change directions. Change the focus. Pick up your foot. Put on your track shoes. Don't walk. Put on your cleats. Don't walk. Don't skip. But run like a bear's chasing your butt. 
I mean, get up and st get your hands like this. And don't, whatever you do, don't stop and don't look back. And you look back, they'll be, come back. They, because they always cry when you break it. I love you. I need you. I need you. Don't look back. So if you don't look back, you won't hear it. You should have said all that stuff when I was in the, with you. Everybody's sorry when you break in covenant. Everybody cries when they're caught. I catch you stealing, you kept the kids stealing. They start crying. You ain't even, you ain't even whooped them yet. When they did that, I used to go to take Jordan in the room to whoop her, give her spanking. I get her in that room. Mommy went in there. She said, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> did she say? She said, wait, 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 wait. Hold it a minute. Hold it. We've got to talk about this. <laughs> and she was about five years old. Cute, little, cute like Roro. And then she said to me, now, what, what? What, how's this going to play out? Am I going to get two hard ones or one hard one soft slick? How's this working? Well, I was thinking three. Three? Don't you think three's too many? How about two soft, one hard? How about five soft, no hard? And I got my mind wheeling. Well, I don't know. Maybe it should be five soft, three hard. What? And then she said, wait a minute. Before you even get into that thought, have I told you this? But I love you. <laughs> then she grabbed my hand like little JoJo does. She grabbed my face. You're so pretty. <laughs> you know what I do, Mimi? I go out there and say, Mary, I get in and whoop your daughter. <laughs> you can't whoop somebody that talks to you like that. That's just too much mercy on me. <laughs> I know there's a little devil in Mary Ann. Get in there and whoop your kid. <laughs> It's probably the other way around. More righteousness in Mary Ann than the little devil in me. The hardest thing to do to whoop the enemy it's not the enemy that's your problem. It's your feelings of having to break relationship with wrong people because your mind starts thinking is there anybody else out there for me? Because you've got so used to the wrong place and the wrong feeling feels better than no feeling for a season. Loneliness hurts, but it's that lonely place can be the only place God finds you. And it's the real you he finds lonely place he shows up but he waits for you to get out of that place and then you're all alone crying and you're like God I feel all alone and and then he just uh, you'll feel something just come in the room and get close to you and all of a sudden you start crying and you, you start remembering all the wrong things oh I shouldn't have did that how could I be so black because that's what Dominic said he said his daughter came home one day he said she said she, she told him she said I was sitting on the couch, Daddy, uh-huh, all by myself. And it was like blinders came on. And I started crying. And she said, it was like I was looking at me sitting on the couch. I said, who are you, Veronica? Where, how far have you fallen? And she said, and the only thing I could think was running home to you, Daddy. And she said, I just knew if I could, if I get home, you wouldn't preach at me. You'd let me come back to the right place. And now she's fist to get married. She's breaking the generational curse of his house. The first child in his bloodline to be married since him. Satan was after it.
How many know there's a recovery anointing on this house right now? How many know you got things God wants to put back in right order? Stretch your hand toward me. Stretch your Let's go home. We'll come back. We'll come back. We'll come back. We're, we're, we're going to bring this. we break in generational curses. we break in strongholds in your life. We come again. I don't care what your father did, your grandfather did, your great grandfather. I don't care where poverty is traced in your bloodline. Poverty is broke today in your house. Listen to me. Relational damage is broke today in your house. And if tears start flowing, let them flow. I don't care what, what nationality, Asian, Italian. I don't care if you're Latino. It doesn't matter if you're African. It doesn't matter whatever. Uh, Ethiopian. Listen to me. It doesn't matter if you're English, Ireland, Irish. It doesn't matter. Why? Because the blood of Jesus, Yeshua, is loud enough to silence ever wrong voice and it's strong enough to break every wrong chain and it's pure enough to pay for your injustice say I receive today a new mantle I receive recovery I will not repeat generational failures but I will start a new generation in my seed and my womb. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. My children's children will know it. And I repent. If you're a parent today, repent. I repent for anything my bloodline did against God's righteous. My sons and daughters will not pay for it. My Savior already did. Now, if you believe that, I want you to jump to your feet and give God a shout of praise like you ain't never did. And today, I want you to shout with a shout of triumph. I want you to jump to your feet. If you're watching, you ought to jump to your feet and give God a shout. I can't hear you. I mean, open up your mouth. Shout. Shout. Say, praise your Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. Look at me. Some of you have said that you were bringing your seeds for the conference. Somebody called me and said, I wasn't there. I didn't get to make it Wednesday. I got my seed. If that's you, go ahead and sow it. Lay it on the platform or give it to an usher on the way out. If you're a first-time guest or visitor on the way out, my left, out that door, there's an information desk. There will be ministers there, people there that love you and greet you uh, and want to give you a free gift and let you know how much we're so glad you're here with us. We're a kingdom church. We want you to be a part of the kingdom economy. If you're watching, thank you so much. You can go online and do it. Hug about four or five people and let somebody know, let somebody know that you really care about them in Jesus' name. Jeremy, take us away.